The Oracle Network. Hey, 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 Rainbow Warriors. This is my disclaimer. Beyond the Rainbow is a true crime podcast. It's not suitable for young children, and maybe not even for some adults. I tend to swear like a sailor, and I'm kind of proud of that. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors, and welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBTQ+. I'm your host, CJ. Find me on the socials, Beyond the Rainbow at Facebook and Instagram, and Rainbow Crimes just about everywhere else. When you get a chance, please follow me on the socials. I'm on Facebook at Beyond the Rainbow, Twitter, TikTok, and Tumblr as Rainbow Crimes, Instagram as Rainbow Crimes 12, and YouTube as Rainbow Crimes Unicorn Justice. I tried to go with just Rainbow Crimes on YouTube, but apparently there's a musical group named Rainbow Crimes. Hmm. If you'd like to help this one woman researched, written, recorded, edited, and produced show, please take a look at my merch store under Rainbow Crimes at Tee Public. Another way to show your support is through Buy Me a Coffee. Buymeacoffee.com backslash Rainbow Crimes. It offers listeners a way to support podcasts without breaking the bank or putting you on a monthly gotta pay subscription. Other ways to support the shows you listen to is by leaving a five-star review. This helps the podcast algorithm gods and goddesses find the podcast. Gaining visibility for often overlooked victims of the LGBTQ plus community? Well, that's my goal for Beyond the Rainbow. And finally, please tell a friend. Pass the word along, and let's get these stories heard. Thank you, my warriors. If you'd like to be a part of this show and tell of a missing but not forgotten LGBTQ plus person, please DM me on the socials or email me through my website at beyondtherainbowpodcast.com. I will send you a script, and all you have to do is read it, record it, and email it back to me. You don't need fancy equipment. Just record it on your phone or computer. It's that simple. This Minnesota's missing but not forgotten LGBTQ plus person is 16-year-old trans girl Maya Keen from the UK. Maya has been missing since Friday morning, September 3rd, 2021. She left her home around 7.30 a.m. in Essex. Maya is 155.4 centimeters tall, or 5'10 to us in America. She is thin build and has shoulder-length brown hair, and in the photo I saw it looked like Maya might have braces on her teeth. CCTV footage shows her at the Liverpool Street Station at 8.04 p.m. This leaves her family to believe she was headed to London. On the footage, Maya is wearing a pink wig, a short white skirt, white tights, white shoes, and a pink top. She also has a rolling black bag with her, like a suitcase, and a black puma bag, along with a small white shoulder bag. Maya is considered a vulnerable girl, and her family said her disappearance is very uncharacteristic for her. Maya just recently came out as trans. She might not want to be found, but she's still a minor and her safety is of utmost importance to her family. Trans people are targets of transphobia just about everywhere, it seems. So let's get Maya home to her family if possible. For pictures of what Maya looks like, please check out the beyondtherainbowpodcast.com website. Should you have information that will lead to finding Maya, please dial 101 and quote M as in Michael, P as in police, C as in cute, backslash 4367 backslash 21. Her family is extremely worried for her safety. Our true crime quickie this mini comes to us from Chester, Pennsylvania. 
And this is a Rainbow Warrior suggestion from my friend Jessica in New Jersey, who is actually responsible for the Missing But Not Forgotten segment that I now do. Jessica helps to provide me with endless information of missing but not forgotten LGBTQ people. Thank you, Jessica, for everything you do to help get the word out there. May 1st, May Day, an International Workers' Day for some. As a kid, I remember May 1st fondly. It was a day that the teacher at school would attach streamers or ribbons to the tetherball pole, and then she would select some of us to hold the end of the ribbons, and then we would dance around the pole. Wow, I guess I was once a pole dancer and didn't even realize it. It was also a day to pick flowers from the neighbor's yard and run like hell so the neighbor didn't catch me. Then I would take the flowers home for my mom. You know what I'm doing right now, warriors? I'm softening you all up talking about my childhood. Because I have another dating site hookup app type related case. The hookup site this time is Adam for Adam. It's really not my fault that there's so many crimes around hookup sites. But we do need to be aware of them, and we need to learn about our victims. They're members of our LGBTQ plus family. For Nick McBee in Chester, Pennsylvania, May 1st was definitely not about flowers and dancing. May 1st, 2014, was the day Nick had to report his life partner, 25-year-old Dino Dizderovich, missing with the Philadelphia Police Department but we'll get to that a little later. Dino was supposed to be home May 1st. He was supposed to be catching a flight out of Pennsylvania to Kentucky to go visit his family. Dino was a very responsible man. If he said he'd be somewhere, he would. Dino was also extremely committed to his family. When Dino was a teenager, he and his family fled war-torn Bosnia. This was in 1993. The family ended up in Richmond, Kentucky, thanks to a church who sponsored them to come to the United States. See that? I can see good in a church who does a good thing. They put money towards saving a family from violence in another country, rather than towards a hundred-foot illuminated cross. Dino's sister, Una, said that Dino was almost a genius. He was a super intelligent guy. He loved science and art. He would often dig up whatever he could find around the house to make science experiments, much to his parents' chagrin, because these experiments were usually very messy. Dino also had a great sense of humor. He picked up the English language rather quickly, and he studied at the University of Louisville, graduating with a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering. Sometime during his school career, Dino met his boyfriend, Nick. After graduation, Dino was offered a position as an operational excellence manager at Steppen Company in New Jersey. This would be in September 2013. And right across the Delaware River lies Chester, Pennsylvania. This is where Dino and Nick found their home. And Thanksgiving of 2013 was the last time Dino's family had seen him. It was when he had flown home for the holiday. So Dino's family hadn't seen him in months, and they were really looking forward to seeing him on May 1st. In spite of Dino and Nick's relationship being somewhat new, it was one of love, communication, and support of each other. Nick and Dino, like a lot of couples, had decided monogamy wasn't really for them so they entered into an open relationship. They were committed to each other, but they agreed to be able to see other guys for sexual encounters. On April 30th, 2014, Dino texted Nick. He told him he would be meeting up with this hot guy he met on a hookup site, Adam for Adam, and he also told Nick he'd be home in a couple of hours. Dino's body was found in an alleyway on the 900 block of Parker Street, about 7.30 a.m. on May 1st. He had been strangled and he suffered multiple blunt force injuries to his face. Since Nick 
couldn't give the police much information about who Dino was meeting. They weren't very helpful in helping find justice for Dino. Dino and Nick would always try to be safe meeting dates. Usually they'd bring a hookup back to their house. April 30th was a little different with Dino going out to meet a date. Apparently this date lived very near Chester, in Philadelphia. As the night progressed, Nick knew something was wrong. Dino would always call if he was going to be late. He would call Nick to check in with him and let him know exactly where he was and that he was safe. But Dino didn't call this time, and Nick's intuition turned out to be right. Nick was freaking out the morning of May 1st when Dino still hadn't come home. He knew he was supposed to drop Dino at the airport for his trip to Kentucky. Nick called Dino's family to let them know Dino had not come home the night before. But Nick did ask a family member to go to the airport in Louisville, Kentucky, to see if Dino would get off the plane. Dino's sister, Una, waited at the terminal for her brother. Nick went to file a missing persons report on Dino at the Philadelphia police station, as I mentioned earlier. When he told him what he wished to do, police gave him shit because he wasn't a direct relative to Dino. They told him to come back in 72 hours, which is absolute bullshit. Refusing to sit on this, Nick enlisted the help of a tech wizard friend of his named Mike. Together, they learned the guy Dino was going to meet was most likely a catfish, because the photos the guy used on Adam for Adam were that of an adult entertainment actor, a guy in porn films. Nick and Mike felt that it was highly unlikely a porn actor is out using a sex hookup site. But Nick and Mike took their investigation a step further. The app Adam for Adam allowed them to zoom in on the approximate location of where the guy Dino met lived and the two men drove to the Philadelphia neighborhood, where the guy's app pinged. Nick and Mike drove grid by grid until they were able to narrow it down to within a hundred feet of where the guy Dino met was. It was very close to the alleyway Dino was murdered in. Nick and Mike took pictures of the downtrodden neighborhood. They took a screenshot of where the guy Dino met pinged at, and then Nick went back to the police department with what he and Mike had accomplished. He showed the police the app they used to track Dino's date, and he showed the police the pics and the screenshot of the neighborhood the guy was in. Nick and Mike left the police station, and they started to call Dino's cell number over and over again. Finally, someone picked it up. It was a man. The man on the other end said he found the phone. He was nervous about meeting Nick to return it, but he agreed to turn it over to the detective Nick had been speaking with. Nick then asked the man exactly where he had found the phone, and the man told him. It was the same sketch neighborhood that they had just left earlier. So Nick and Mike headed back. When they got back to the neighborhood, they saw some guys just standing around and they went over to talk to him. They told him they were looking for their friend. The guys asked if the friend they were looking for was a white dude. Nick said, yes, and they said a white dude was found murdered a couple blocks away. Nick and Mike went back to the Philadelphia Police Department. Yes, there was a John Doe that had been brought into the medical examiner earlier that morning. Nick was taken in to identify Dino's body, but Dino's face had been so badly beaten and it was so swollen, Nick had to identify Dino from the clothing he left in the night before. There have been little to no leads on this case. The police have Dino's phone, and they've been slow to get past the encryption on it. It's been over seven years. I'm sure they've broken the code by now. But where is Dino's killer? They cleared the guy who found Dino's phone, so it would seem that Dino's killer is apparently still running around free as a bird. 
because no one has ever been able to answer for his crime, there has definitely been zero unicorn justice for Dino. Should you be able to help solve this case? If you have answers as to who Dino met that night in that little Philadelphia neighborhood near Parker Street, please call Pennsylvania Crime Stoppers at 1-800-472-8477 or call the Chester Detective at 610-447-8428. Rest in power, Dino. Love you, Rainbow Warriors. Remember, it's not a crime to be gay. Unless you're a murderer. <laughs>